Uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'm JT Takagi of Third World Newsreel, a progressive media center that encourages media by and about people of color through educational distribution, production, exhibition, and training. This event tonight is being presented by the Spellman Documentary Program with Third World Newsreel, along with the Dominicans Love Haitians Movement, the Atlanta Documentary Society, and with some help from the Documentary Forum at CCNY. We're pleased to welcome you to our event tonight, the film Stateless, by the award-winning filmmaker Michelle Stevenson, who joins us tonight along with Claudia Ruiz, founder and creator of the Dominicans Love Haitians Movement, and with Anjanette Levert, filmmaker and Spelman College professor, introducing the talk. I hope you had a chance to view the film, but it will continue streaming until February 27th, Saturday at 6.30 p.m. I want first, though, to have you join me in acknowledging that in New York, we're on the unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape, Canarsie, Shinnecock, and Muncie peoples. In Georgia, we are on the land of Eastern Cherokee and the Lower Muscogee Creek tribe. We acknowledge and challenge the harm that continues to be inflicted upon indigenous and people of color communities here and abroad, which is why we need to be part of the struggle for rights, equality, and justice. Now, as we start, let me lay out the Zoom protocol we're following. We would like you to keep muted, but to post your questions and comments in the chat, which we'll then forward to the speakers. Also, we will be presenting short intros for people, but you'll be able to see fuller bios in the chat. By the way, this event tonight is also a fundraiser for Dominicans Love Haitians Movement. Please donate to their GoFundMe site, which you can see in the chat. Now I'd like to introduce Anjanette Levert, who organized this event tonight. Anjanette Levert works in the documentary sphere as a filmmaker, producer, podcaster, curator, coach, and professor at the number one HBCU, Spelman College. As I mentioned, her full bio will be in the chat. Anjanette, in turn, will introduce our speakers tonight. Anjanette? Yes, so um, as um, thank you so much for that introduction, JT. So just, um, we have, of course, with us, um, Clarivel Ruiz, who is the founder and creative director for Dominicans Love Haitians Movement. And we also have, of course, the filmmaker um, of this wonderful, really beautiful film, Michelle Stevenson. So thank you both for being here. And um, yes, so I, I first have to talk about, you know, like the imagery of the film. So we're just gonna get right into it. So I first need to talk about the image, imagery of the film and kind of this, um, this kind of like ethereal um, uh, feeling that it has. And then, um, you know, the upside down drone shots, uh, you know, and then also we have this other, um, it, it feels like a folk tale that runs through the film that comes back and back and back. And everyone is generally in silhouettes when we're telling that film, that story. So if you could talk a little bit about the experimentation that you bring to this particular film. Okay, all right. Well, um, I guess part of, it's interesting, I'm sort of, um, some of the work that I'm doing now and that includes Stateless is this, um, is uh, playing or working and unpacking the notion that the past is so present, right? It lives through us, it lives through our DNA. It's on our shoulders, it's all around us. And I think that for Stateless for me, you know, uh, starting the piece, you know, many years ago, well, uh, in 2013, when the decision came down by the Supreme Court in the Dominican Republic was the impetus for the start, was uh, again this idea that oh I'm sorry sorry I'm sorry I'm supposed to do not disturb um, this idea um, that in some ways genocide is taking a new form right a new form in this space around the statelessness and that the massacre of 1937 that took place against Dominicans of Haitian descent and darker skinned uh, Dominicans. Uh, was important for me to see how can I interweave that to show and to maybe um, kind of provoke the idea that uh, on Rosa's shoulders lie these ancestors 
these ancestors who are informing her, who are sort of supporting her, giving her the 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 the, the courage to you know do what she's doing. And so, from the very beginning, I always wanted to include. Um, someone from 1937 or the massacre of 1937 and interweave it in it, but interweave it from a magical realist perspective through this legend, through a story where you, you get to learn the story, you learn the brutality of the story, but through this magical realist lens that allows us to kind of experience it from this kind of almost sort of spiritual way uh, 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 that the ghost is present. And so we did a lot of research actually, we went to, uh, to the, to the board, I, I actually spoke with uh, sur uh, both survivors of, of the massacre who were on the Haitian side, um, who were in the early 90s, and also with people, uh, some of whom hid uh, uh, um, people who were trying to escape, as well as people who were actually forced to dig some of the graves, uh, the mass graves that are still not marked, right? Uh, uh, that we still don't know where they are. Uh, well, we have a sense of where they are, but they're not marked. Um, so that was kind of the impetus to kind of play with this idea and understanding like coming from that culture, I'm originally from, from uh, Haiti, uh, my mother's from Panama, so the Caribbean is sort of the heart of my, where my ancestors are, are from. Um, and being seeped in the notion of storytelling and understanding our human condition through storytelling and through uh, specifically sort of magical realist understandings of you know, not just that the past is present, but we live with our ghosts, you know, among us, sort of. Mm, okay, okay, I can, I can totally see that. And, but I'm also wondering, like, what were the particular choices that you made? So there's, um, I'm thinking of like, uh, you mean the visual? You no, know, you made a choice to have the people in silhouette. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So um, there was definitely an aesthetic choice to um, I'm, I'm going it, one of the uh, one of the uh, inspirations for this aesthetic choice came uh, by, from an article in the New York Times by the photographer uh, reviewer um, uh, Teju Cole, and he talked about embracing blackness. In, in, in photography and that you don't need to reveal everything that sometimes we need to stay, stay in the darkness. And sometimes that darkness can reveal things to us. And that there, it has, that is an intentional specific choice of photographers like the Kavara, I'm gonna mispronounce his name, the Kavara, um, as well as some of uh, uh, the work of uh, Bradford Young too, uh, around uh, not just silhouettes, but darkness and playing with uh, different uh, shades of darkness. And so for me, that was definitely sort of an intentional uh, um, thing to do and to work with the various uh, directors of photographies that I work with both some, uh, many of whom were actually Dominican uh, 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 cinematographers um, in that space. And so we experimented mostly in, uh, in dusk, at dusk mm -hmm. and uh, evenings. Um, it's kind of the magic hour for capturing, you know, beautiful imagery, but also the notion that you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to see the full, the full um, figure, the full face to uh, understand, to understand meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then that flips to how you treated a lot of the footage with the, um, with the politicians and particularly um, the president Danilo, right? Yeah. So yeah. like, it reminded me of, I think it's like Black Audio Collective where they in like Hans, Hansworth, Hans, in, the, in the Hansworth film where, you know, everything is blown up. And, and I, I appreciated like some of the like lip service, close-ups on the lips and that sort of thing. So if you, I mean, am I right? Is that where the- Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. We were playing with, like there were these three different planes of visual sort of imagery that were very intentional. One was, one was the legend and the imagery of the legend and the silhouettes and the lyrical uh, uh, elements that we were bringing out, the expressionistic elements, but also understanding the sort of a, a magical realist language. Then there was the very kind of observational you know, purely observational sort of moments where we were in the moment now with Rosa Iris, right? And with the work that she was doing and with Teofilo, as well as with Gladys, we were in the moment 
with them. Uh, and then there were these moments of what I call the propaganda <laughs> moments, right? Where, where it was the president, it was the radio, it was the media and the media propaganda had its own aesthetic uh, treatment that we used that was harsher, even uh, sonorically, it was different as well. That we, and, 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 and the juxtapositions between that hopefully kind of like summed up, it was more than the sum of its parts, but it was very intentional, the blown up pixelation to give us that sense of, uh, uh, of uh, media manipulation that is also kind of in its own false city of worlds, you know, in its own um, sort of uh, uh, uses its own storytelling devices yes. to oppress, right? right, and to justify. Right. So I'm going to, so I think the the political part is right, right where I can kind of um, bring Clarivel Ruiz in into the conversation. So, if you would like so wonderfully talk about your organization, why you got started, um, you know, because I I'm assuming that is like on the back of this this decision that you know maybe even if you had it in the back of your head, but on the back of this decision was like the impetus to like go. <clears throat> is that true? Uh, thank you, Anjana, for your, your for your question. Um, the the answer is uh, yes, no, right? Because when we first yes, no, in that when we first traveled back to the Dominican Republic in two thousand nine, um, like many people who immigrate here to the United States, there are those who are, who have this desire and vision that they're going to go back, right? That they're going to go back to wherever it is that they've come. They've they've amassed whatever wealth. Then you know, in their eight seventies and eighties, they can retire. They can they can go back home, and that was one of the things that happened with our father that he wanted to go back home, and so inside of that, we really recognize being born here, raised in New York City, traveling to to the Dominican Republic um, as an adult, and look and <clears throat> faced with racism here is is a particular, it, it shows up in a particular way, right, mm -hmm. versus when we we eventually learn that racism shows up in another way in the Dominican Republic and soon and being participate being inside of that world we saw that it was uh, much more harsher conditions in some respect in the sense of the anti-blackness right here you can be like oh that there are uh, you know it's very odd white people are here they're against us but what do you do when when it's those who look like you who are who are perpetuating this level of um, discrimination, this heightened level of discrimination and prejudice. And, um, and so when we went, uh, our father had been holding a secret that, that his grandmother was Haitian. And it was just like, well, why would you keep this? And in that, that moment, our mother said, if I would have known, I never would have married you. 50 years of marriage never would have happened. But the, the, the thing that really struck is that our father growing up with him was a womanizer. He was an alcoholic. Uh, it was an abusive household. And it's just like, so him being Haitian would stop you from marrying him, from loving him, but all these other things that have happened wouldn't. And, um, and so for us in that moment in 2009, we realized that this, that this, this, we, we needed to do something because this, this was showing up for us as a real illness. We could then finally extract ourselves and see how how deep of an illness this is. That this kind of messaging would would be pervasive inside of our culture, inside of this culture that would accept one thing, but would not accept another. And it's just like you know we so in that realization, then we started doing our due diligence because we realized we we're like we have you know growing up here in the United States, Westernized you know history and information. We were like we have no idea why we have this sort of idea of why why you know that there's this conversation that exists but but we needed to deepen it we needed to deepen it and inside of that research we found information about how um dominicans of of haitian descent were being treated in the dominican republic with uh the inability to receive their identification cards or having or having difficulties if they if their children were born there there was a uh, uh, instances of just making it so twice as hard just to receive uh, support to re to have your children have their identification cards and we could see at that point we were like we could see it coming you know you know when you just have that realization this there's something that's eminent 
And if this continues as it as it seems to be progressing, one of these, and it really was like one of these days, I'm going to try to take their their you know their 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 citizenship away. It, and it was just the thought of, and then, and as as we were progressing, attempting to figure out what to do with this information, you know, with this information that we gleaned from our father, and being like, how do we integrate these things that we see that could be happening, and um, then this then the then the actual law started uh, was changed in 2013 so and and then it was like okay you you now do have to do something you can't you, you can't continue to continue to think about it or talk about it now there has to be a real um upsweep of taking actions to support what you what you from your point of view from my point of view like how can i support what's actually happening to um to deal with with anti-blackness, to deal with this internalized oppression and anti-Haitianism that exists within our cultures, and I say cultures as in you know all all of our cultures, not just particular to the Dominican Republic. Anti-blackness shows up in in Haiti, in here, in you know in in all all places, and so it's for us it's our it's our job, as we see it. Uh, as we've been called forth to to do it by our ancestors to to create what there is to start impacting how we see each other. Hmm. So that was that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. okay. So what does your organization do? So basically, we use we use art as our we we use art as a foundational tool to unlearn racism. So is is looking at experimenting, looking at different art techniques to really utilize that to have discussions and to, to support an intergenerational audience to really have not only discussions, but to look at how do we embody these concepts that, we, that were never ours in the first place. Hmm. How can we un, undo that which is within us? You know, Michelle talked about our DNA. Uh, there are many principles, you know, in Buddhism, for instance, where we, we talk about chanting in order to um, heal seven generations back and seven generations forward. So is looking at utilizing art to do that, to start start healing the to start the healing process of colonization. So also personally for us to understand how can we use um, art techniques to uh, you know to to less to disrupt how we want to see how we always as human beings we create others we create people as strangers right and so someone who's a stranger is dangerous versus like that we all have these the, we are we're we're all human right <laughs> although there are those people who don't understand that <laughs> um because of the process of dehumanizing dehumanization that has taken place but for us to come to understanding how we operate so that we don't see each other as dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and so of, oh, you go. No, I, we were going to say, and so one of the, one of our projects that we've been we've been uh, utilizing is uh, the Black Doll Project, yes. which is where we ask people to donate. So it's a gift giving, right? You people gift uh, dolls, black dolls that we send back to communities, Haitian and Dominican communities so that this, this child can see themselves represented because as we know, social, social media, uh, social, you know, the systematic racism really is pervasive. And so there, and inside of this lack of being able to see yourself as a black person, to see yourself, especially as a child, to receive a doll, to receive something that you can, that you can then, it emulates who you are, was very important for us. And so that's one of the actions that we've been taking. We're asking people to donate black dolls. We send them um, back overseas mm -hmm. and also creating workshops where young people, it, it's actually an intergenerational audience where they can create their own dolls and inside of that, start dismantling how we see ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, how we view not not only someone else but also ourselves inside of this this bias that we that we may walk with that we're not even aware that is there, mm -hmm. or and to have be able to have those discussions, right? And so that brings me to Gladys. Um, you know, the character, uh, the national, um, Dominican nationalists um, in the film. And 
she really, you know, at, at, go, going through what we um, what we recently went through in terms of the 2020 presidential election, and to hear her talk, uh, you know, to state her her position, you know, um, really, you know, I had to like actually be with that and like, and it's what Claribel is just saying, which is that like, I'm looking at her outwardly and I'm just thinking, wait, 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 what's happening here? Is this, you know, some some sort of, not, um, you know, some some sort of trick? Who is this woman? And and also we see that through, um, I just remember the one where, um, so there was two things that really got me. One is that she is like a sugar addict. And I'm like, the people that you want to send back, cut the sugar cane that you so love. And like, that just like, it's not even like a thing for her. And then when she goes in and she finds the projects, you know, and then like the guy runs it down for her. You know, this is what happened. They brought us here, da, 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 da. And then her whole argument was like, he's too old to have been a part of that movement. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. So if, you know, um, so Michelle, how did you like, hold it together, um, you know, for, for that. Like, what was it like really working with her? Because, you know, that, that would be, you know, like, I'm not gonna, you know, there's mega supporters. I am here in Atlanta and there's certainly mega supporters and I'm never doing that interview. Never, 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 right? So, you know, if you could talk us through, um, you know, what, what was that like and being with her and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um. So uh, there were a couple, I can go, I'll, I'll go like real, the, well, I, I wanna, th there was a whole journey to getting to Gladys and it's, okay. it, it, and maybe I can go. So I, so I myself as a light skinned woman of Haitian descent, um, you know, I, I experience a lot of privilege when I go both to the DR and to Haiti, right? And so my initial instinct was actually I know that there are Haitian, uh, um, uh, Dominican born uh, folks who, whose parents are Haitian, who are lighter skin and privileged, who have no problem. <laughs> they have no, they got their passport, they got everything, right? And I was following one and it was because of my own, I, I said, I have, when I go there, I gotta challenge myself. I have to challenge my own privileges. You know, I have to challenge and see what spaces can I go in where I can I can get something that adds a little bit more complexity to what's going on on the island and a little more sort of, uh, you know, uh, access. And this particular person, I spent quite a long time with her. And at the end, the privilege was very difficult um, to penetrate. I don't think we ever, she ever gained trust. <laughs> we ever really gained trust. Um, and so I, I had to make a decision in terms of uh, from the story perspective that this story wasn't really going to really be a, a strong enough compliment to the police because I needed to get into the deep complications of, of her story and the privilege of light skinned Haitians in the Dominican Republic, you know, and, and the elites on both sides, you know, that, that work together, right, to exploit uh, based on the racial caste system that exists on that island. And so I uh, had conversations with the field producers and, and the idea was also to sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, infiltrate the ultranationalist movement and that uh, I would need to do that, right? I would need to do that because, uh, uh, and I would need to sort of be uncomfortable, um, but open uh, and be open to receiving the, the, the stories. And the and the uh, the adamant sort of um, um, the adamant fanaticism. That's all. I, it's fanaticism, right? It's a religious, you know. Uh, and I wasn't there to convince her otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so I went there. Uh, we actually went through a casting process. There were a few other people that we we interviewed before we landed on Gladys. They were mostly men, 
uh, they were, ex it was very difficult for me to even spend half an hour with them because the conversation was extremely aggressive. It was very aggressive. I was like, I gotta spend maybe two years with you. <laughs> How am I going to do that just psychologically, right? And so, and then we landed on Gladys. Gladys is, she was actually running for office and she didn't win, but she's part of the ultra nationalist movement there. And uh, I spoke with her, she was very pleasant. And, but then, and she wanted to tell her story. And that's what I, and that's, you know, part of what- That's filmmaking uh, goal. Yeah, exactly. She wanted to tell a story and she says, Michelle, you can go to wh whoever you want, go to the other side, get the other side story, but I want, I'm going to take you all around the country and I'm going to show you what is going on, what is really going on. And it was really funny because every time we would go, it would not be what she expects, you know, but so it was, it, so th there were aspects of her that I recognize in terms of even my own family, but then there was this whole spewing of hatred that I had to swallow. And she she never knew that I was Haitian. I never told her. I never told her about my, my past. She never even asked. She hmm. just thought I was American or Canadian coming down to tell the story and that she wanted to tell her story. And I swear, I, I almost didn't even have to ask that many questions. I would ask one question and then it would all, but it would always come back to it's because of the Haitians, right? And so I realized that, well, first of all, I knew I wasn't gonna change her mind, but for me, what was important, what, what was important to have her voice there for two. One, to understand from Rosa's perspective, what she and the community are up against, right? Mm -hmm. But also this other angle that you talked about of internalized oppression. As mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned, Gladys is a black woman. You know, I don't know what she sees in front in the mirror, but white supremacy is so effective yes. that we don't even see ourselves. Right. We don't even see ourselves. It is so insidious and effective. And I feel that that was, those were two conversations that needed to be had that she sort of hit. But for me, it was extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, um, you know, the, the 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 more she was um she was very generous you know th there was a whole aspect of her that was endearing otherwise i don't know how i would have stayed that long but that other aspect i swear every time i would spend a couple of days with her i would need to sort of detox for half a day and just cry in my in my hotel room because of everything that you know was sort of like floating in my head as a result of it and my inability to sort of counter it or not in a bill my choice not to counter right. it right uh, because i felt that that narrative is important and understanding that we're not in a battle of facts we're in a battle of narratives and it's about who takes the space for the narrative to really be present for us all and for for our children right that's what's that's what's at stake because they, they are a minority when you think about it but they have a big bullhorn right. a huge bullhorn with money behind them Right. So I just wanted to, so then that brings me to, um, you know, um, Rosa Iris had to leave. Yes. You know, and um, because of, of threats. And so this rise of nationalist, nationalism, you know, that's happening really across the world. And, you know, they were, pre, you know, like we can say that, you know, 45 got it started, right? But in fact, this was happening before then, right? So then, you know, maybe this, there was this sentiment that's starting to happen around the world that actually allowed 45 to like come to power and these other people because like the, the, um, the ground had been laid, right? So then just thinking about, um, you know, also the, the different things that um, people are enduring in our country, you know, particular, not just, you know, there's the BLM movement, but then also Asian Americans have been targeted because of the rhetoric that has been used around the pandemic. So um, actually I'm, mm. No, I'm just gonna say that it's, it's it's just that, you know, this is part of a continuum. It's not, you know, it's not something new. Like, that's why I think the massacre is so important. And if we take this white supremacy from a, from a hemispheric perspective, right? The, 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 
the massacres of 37 is at the same time as the lynchings in the South, you know, and what we what we witnessed in uh, on January 6 is nothing but a lynching mob, you know, right. that has a, its own history and it's all interconnected all the way down to Brazil and Bolsonaro and the killing of the uh, of the um, of the black uh, uh, LGBTQ rights activist uh, down there. Uh, uh, these are all interconnected questions that it, we, it, it's important for us to see it from that perspective in the same way that the resistance is also hemispheric, right? right. Like when George Floyd, you know, uh, was lynched, right? Uh, uh, there were protests in the Dominican Republic and, and, and women went to jail as a result of this, right? And the same across the world. So I hear what you're saying about 45, but I think that we, it's important for us to think about it beyond just him because sure. it is this historical, it's nothing new, <laughs> essentially sure. Sure. in that sense, you know? Sure. And, 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 and yeah, anyway, I could go on, sorry. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, so Clarivel, I just wanted to bring you into this because, you know, we know that like the largest number of Dominicans who live outside of the Dominican Republic is right there in New York City. And, you know, and then also there's always, you know, back and forth, you know, people are moving freely back and forth between New York and, you know, um, and, and the Dominican Republic, you know, as well as Haiti and that sort of thing. So then like, how does that, you know, these sentiments are these sentiments traveling back and forth? Because there's a whole different setup here in the United States in terms of how we d deal with this. In many ways, you know, I was getting um, I was getting emails from people when I said that I was going to do this do this screening because they're like, "Oh, how'd you know I was Dominican? How did you know I was Haitian?" I was like, "I didn't. You're black here in Atlanta, but okay, cool." Awesome. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> you know, so if you could talk a little bit about about, you know, are things moving back and forth and like how does how real are their threats also in the United States? I mean, we already know from Rosa um, Iris, right? So, you know, if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, I mean, look, we just have to look at the these proud boys, one of them, the, the, the main one of the, the main person is Afro, um, Afro Cuban. And you'd be like, well, how is it possible that these proud boys are, mm -hmm. are black, like, don't they understand what white supremacy is about? Um, so all of, <laughs> it, it is pervasive is pervasive over the, over in the in the Caribbean is pervasive over here death threats, you know, um, un unfortunately, there are many Dominican nationalists here in the United States, here in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, we definitely were, there are many people who are in the movement um, to counteract these, these ideologies around anti-Haitianism who have been targeted. We were targeted in 2020, in, in um, June of 2020. And um, because we posted something that they uh, were in disagreement of. And inside of that, we were immediately, you know, called uh Haitian pro Haitian you know they were using these words to and to, they were, they were using these terms specifically to uh entice to you know instigate yes. this uh this this violence towards us and then got we and we were getting bombarded we were getting bombarded on social media we were getting bombarded um and also bombarded on outside of social media inside of uh, our, our our photos being sent around WhatsApp and being like, if you see her in Washington Heights, and it's like, well, well if you see her, what? And obviously, this is an implied threat. Um, Rosa, I see these. You know, her son was taken. That how you know how, and and all the time throughout the movie, she's just like, how do I raise my child? You know, how do how do I give to my child? And then with Theophilio, like seeing the pain that he's going through, not being able to be with his children, and to think, you know, at this point here we're in the states, and we're like, well, where could we go? Because people who are okay, so fortunate, fortunately, Rosa Isidis is here, but we were like, well, where do we go? Because these people who are bombarding us, bombarding who are who are literally being violent towards us, they're all over. They're, they're, these messages are coming all over from Spain, 
from Greece. It's just like, well, where do you, where do I, where do I escape to mm -hmm. inside of these Dominican nationalists that are showing up violently, uh, attempting to look for you? And we've seen them actually, you know, other people that we know that they actually did follow them to their homes, you know, mm -hmm. to 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 and, and be violent. Mm -hmm. And so um, there is really no place where you can escape. In, in that respect. So, and the most important thing is that you there, since there's no escape and what they're, they're out to do is to silence you is to be much more vocal. It's to actually, you know, be like, you are not going to do that, which is to take away the one thing that all of us have a right to, which is our, is to our voice. And unfortunately in, in meeting these people, it's no matter what you, you can't really say anything because they're so, um, tied to their narrative they, they no matter what the proof is because as you see with gladys no matter what the proof shows that they're they still will deny what is in front of them they li literally their brain you know right this cognitive dissonance and so no so what do you do with someone like that and so <laughs> how can how can we actually insert ourselves so that they cannot manipulate the situation and that this continues to be reinforced and to actually have them be like questioning why is this the narrative because mm -hmm. that's the, the other thing they don't question it they just you know they ingest it and they go on with it as if it's real when it's not and that is the part of the white supremacy where it, it's this false narrative that's, that has been perpetuated as if it's real and people want to con be those, especially those who benefit from it, want to continue to perpetuate it as if it's, it's, it's real or to be, you know, to ascend themselves so that they are at the highest level themselves. Um, so yeah, these, so it's, it's, so you, there is no escaping what has, what has, um, been manifesting for these last 500 years and now and so now we have we have this is our duty to start um and as we can see here in the states this is oh this has been his existence obama was president but there, it was not hidden the fact that there were so many people who were against him being the president even for these eight years and then when trump trump got the uh, opportunity you know all these other races were like yay <laughs> now yeah, we get to we get to freely ex that's you know we get to freely express our hatred just the way that he does, and we're happy with that. And then you know, unfortunately, people don't understand that we're a world community, and so what happens in one area, you know, can definitely impact, give rise to someone else who will do the same, and and have people believe that they themselves have the right to do that. Yeah. And so we have to be careful. We have to think about ourselves not as as a world community and not the, these uh, these borders that don't exist, these these ideologies about immigration that don't exist um, and and start dealing with that from I think from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have many more questions, um, but I this is the the probably the time to have questions from the audience. Are, are there any? Um, yeah, uh, one person asked, what is Rosa Idris doing now? And is her son with her here now? Yeah, Rosa is in Pittsburgh. She's living in Pittsburgh with a um, community of uh, Dominicans there. She has a, her, her older son is with her and she also has a younger son actually because she was pregnant when she had to uh, leave. And um, interestingly, uh, Rosa got a scholarship to, for, to do an LLM uh, in law at uh, American University in humanitarian and human rights law. And I think she recently finished that and is also working, but is certainly eager to, and is I think still working in the community um, around these questions. Um, and she also has you know, a, a job too, but she was able to, yeah. So she's in Pittsburgh doing well with her two kids. Okay. And um, did, one one question. Ever get his, did one ever get resolved? So no citizenship for, for one to fail. Oh, oh my gosh, that, you know, we, after the film was done, we spent some time trying to help him get his papers. And every time he went with the paper they asked him for, they would ask him for another paper. Uh, and so that happened about four times, I think, in the process. 
And he kind of just said, well, I'm just gonna lay low for a while. And actually Theophil had a stroke about a year ago that he's recovering from. And um, yeah, we're in touch um, supporting him as we can, um, but he's recovering. So mm -hmm. it's not, so he's re recovering uh, on that perspective, but he's back in the DR. And I think he's, he's you know, sort of able to see his kids a little bit more frequently. And we have mm -hmm. someone else. Uh, for, uh, for one thing, everyone's saying really nice things in the chat about the film and you. Uh, so thank you for the beautiful film, Ms. Stevenson. I love the magical realism and folklore. I'm curious at what point in the creative process did Moraimi's story become part of the film spine? I think oh. we kind of covered that, but okay. Well, from the very beginning, we okay. wanted it. I had different ideas. Initially, it was going to be um, a sort of a fictionalized space with a script and with shots and a shot list and an actor and all of that, but we didn't have enough money. <laughs> so we ended up playing with the, when we were out there shooting, we were playing with, well, maybe we make it more expressionistic. And so we, we, we did that. And her story is really inspired by a chapter in the book called uh, El Massacre Se Pasa a Pie by um, Freddy Prestol Castillo. Uh, one of the chapters talks about uh, Moraime who had to hide from, uh, from the military in 37. The whole book is about is about uh, the massacre, um, um, and it's uh, uh, fictionalized as well. So that was the inspiration for the legend that we uh, that I wrote. Yeah. Great. Another person asks, "What does the nationalist movement say about other immigrants in the DR right now, like Venezuelans?" Um, and they were it was their understanding that they're also not treated uh, that are they're treated differently than the Haitians are. Yeah, um, I can't speak to the whole, I can't speak in generalities, but when I was there, first of all, the Venezuelans who were there had a money <laughs> and education, many of them. I'm not saying all of them, but many of them. So they fit into the racial caste system and they were lighter skinned, you know. So they sort of fit into this racial caste system that, um, that they were able to benefit in the same way as certain immigrants who come to the United States, you know, uh, even undocumented. Uh, you know, immigrants that come from Europe have a very different experience than undocumented, you know, immigrants who come from uh, Mexico or uh, Central America. So, but I'm not saying that there isn't sort of a segment of Venezuelan, you know, uh, migrant population that also hasn't suffered. So I'm just saying in terms of what I was exposed to when I was there. Uh, um, but it, what, what's interesting, what I've heard though in the Caribbean is uh, in Puerto Rico, how Dominicans are treated by Puerto Ricans as migrants there is sort of, sort of in some ways uh, at times mirrors um, the, 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 the migrant Haitian and uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent experience in the, the DR. Um, so uh, there's kind of a long question that has to do with uh, when you, uh, the interactions with government officials that were captured on hidden or cam phone cameras the early moment in the film with Rosie Edis and her client in the local office. Um, how was that possible? And uh, could you speak about the process, your process in capturing that? Um, we used hidden cameras um, to enter those. Uh, we used hidden camera there. It was all hidden camera in the, in the, in the checkpoints, which is really a big thing, the checkpoints uh, in the DR from the border to Santo Domingo. Are heavily uh, are heavily uh, militarized um, the checkpoints. There are about six of them, I believe, before you can you get into the city, into the capital, and then the interaction between Teofilo and the uh, pro, the officer uh, in the um, at the junta at the board of elections uh, was also captured an undercover uh, camera. So yeah, they were. This was, uh, we had long conversations on Saidis, uh, Teofilo and myself about what the risks were and what it meant. And they were, they were very eager to, 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 to participate in that way. Um, so another person asked, uh, what, did you encounter danger in doing that? In, do, in doing any of the filming you were doing? I, I, I wasn't really at risk. I mean, I think the people who were at risk were really Bosaides and Teofilo, uh, especially. Uh, I, I, I never felt like I was in danger, but I do know that 
for them, you know, uh, it was risky. I mean, um, uh, to have the camera and some of the people at those offices or people that they interact with on a pretty regular basis, not this man at the end, at the in Santo Domingo, but the woman at the beginning, I think she, they, they have, she's, they're all, they're often in conversation when she's trying to get papers, you know, she's trying to use the system as she can to at least get a little bit of mm -hmm. access for the, 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 the community she's representing. So um, they were the ones who were taking risks. I wasn't really uh, taking, I, I never felt like I was in danger. Um, but people yeah. are asking. So, ladies and gentlemen, we oh, are at nine <laughs> o'clock. Man, that just flew by. But wait, I have, I do have one last question for, um, for Claribel. Yeah, that probably can, can connect it to the public's question about, is there a way for people to assist in this recovery for the Haitians? Well, I think donating to Dominicans Love Haitians is a, is a great start um, to see how, I think some of the work has to be done in the diaspora as well as, as the, on the island. So I would you know heavily encourage people to, um, to look up uh, at the website, Dominicans Love Haitian and to, and to donate. Um, uh, an important, um, it's an important effort because um, it's tackling something that I think is relevant to all of us in a different, in a different way. Um, and we, we need more of that. So my question for Claribel, and, oh, I agree, concur. <laughs> <laughs> so my question for Claribel is also, um, you know, so the political wins are a change, I hope. So we, we're seeing a little bit of that happening here in the United States. You know, will that also translate to, to the Dominican Republic and, you know, places all around the world? Um, so there seems to be this moment to grab the ring. What, you know, what's happening, you know, with the DR and or are you all going to in the future be supporting political candidates who actually might be able to like have some of these fundamental things changed? Uh, we were, we're, we're over here listening to you and be like, what's going on? Um, so <laughs> we, we have a great hope, but un unfortunately right now, the president of Haiti is not stepping down. You know, he's sure. becoming a dictator. So there is that that's happening here. He was emulating what was taking place. Uh, attempted coup, you know, here in the United States, it is happening. It, it, it is, he is in, instilling himself there. He's not stepping down. Uh, unfortunately, Biden just deported a number of, of Haitian people from the, the United States. So we have, we have that to deal with here. So there are many things that still are um, uh, unsettled, things that still need to continue to, to be healed. Uh, continue to be spoken of. Uh, there's there's much work to do. We want to work with young people, um, not on, young people specifically, so that we can empower them. So that that will they will be the next generation to alter how it is, we, how people view who we are as a people. You know, to counteract the narratives that exist right here, right now. And so that's our duty. That's our job. That's what we see for the future is that we're in working with that, with that population, the young, that we can start and that they are so hungry for it. They already are immersed inside of it. They are already uh, pulling it towards them. When we worked with young people in 2019 and we spoke to them in 2020 because of COVID, we couldn't go back. That they were like, we wanna do this. We wanna be racial justice leaders. We wanna do this work for our community. And that, and that is, it's imperative for us to go back to continue doing this work overseas in Dominican and Haitian communities, because this is how, this is, this is the way to alter what is literally happening right here, right now. Um, yes. And so that, that is, that is what we see for the future. And inside of that, you know, maybe they can teach their parents, <laughs> maybe they'll, they'll teach their parents, like have these difficult conversations with their parents yeah. in a way that they may not listen to, you know, uh, uh, other people. Well, so we're, so we're, you know, we are in prayer, we're experimenting and we're, we're really taking actions to like, see how to, how to uh, evolve this 
so that this no longer holds us hostage, this disease, this illness holds us hostage the way that it, that it has. Thank you so much for that. That is wonderful because, um, you know, the children are our future. It, I mean, it sounds, it can be, it can sound trite, but yet and still that is actually the reality of it. And um, you know, they say what else are we gonna do? Sorry, I apologize. In Buddhism, they say that the revolution is with the youth. Yes. The revolution is with the youth. So yeah. they have, and, and as we've seen with BML, um, Black Lives Matter, that that has been, the, they, are the, they are in the ground. They are literally on the ground doing the work, heavy lifting. And so it has to be this, it has to, it has to be the same overseas. Yes. So don't forget to, um, be, before we close out, Dominicans Love Haitians, we're going to be putting the, um, the fundraiser link into the chat one more time. And then JT, would you close us out letting, letting people know what the next events are? Oh, you weren't expecting to do that. Well, well that's fine. So um, in fact, on uh, March 4th, we're doing a, are you ready for distribution workshop? Um, and that link should be in the chat. And uh, on March 9th, we're showing a historic film, a 1971 film called The Women's Film with the filmmakers and uh, today's activists. And it's about the start of the women's second wave women's organizing in the U.S. Um, I'm really thrilled by tonight's event and the film and Michelle and Claire Ravel, you two are doing really important work. So I really salute you. Yes, thank you so much. And so again, we thank you, we appreciate you. You could be doing anything with your evening and yet you chose to come and watch a film and then come on a Zoom call and hear a live Q and A. Ah, audience, you rock. Thank you so much. And we will see you um, next time. Thanks, thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.